Welcome to the Irresistible You podcast. This is the place to get a dose of empowerment to create the life you crave and deserve. I'm your host, Amy Beltran, CEO and founder of Irresistible University. Through my signature online coaching program, I teach women just like you how to ditch the body image issues, gain confidence, and lose the emotional weight to look and feel irresistible at any size. If you would like to learn more about my program and see if you're a good fit for enrollment, head over to irresistibleicing.com slash course. If you'd like to learn even more to ask me questions and speak with me, then you can also schedule a free confidence clarity call at irresistibleicing.com slash call. Those links can also be found in the show notes. Hello there and welcome to this week's episode. Welcome. If you are new to the podcast, make sure you hit that subscribe button if this is your first time listening so that you do not miss another episode. Welcome back if you're an OG listener. Um, All right, guys. So what I'm going to be talking about today on the podcast is I just am going to do kind of a personal update with you guys on how I am doing and where I am at. So for those of you that do not know, I am currently pregnant with my second child. (laughs) Um, As the time I'm recording this, I am 36 weeks pregnant. So I am in the home stretch in the ninth month it's getting really real. Um, and I say this on a lot of episodes, but that is why I always sound in the last couple months on the podcast, I always sound winded like I am running a marathon because essentially I may not be running, but this is a marathon. (laughs) Um, and there's a lot of topics that I, I want to cover, but I just felt like it was time to do kind of a a personal update and of course there's going to be um, a connection here with body image and weight and how that ties into pregnancy and all the emotions and all the feelings and all the things that are going on and I have to tell you I am super in my feelings right now thank you hormones uh, I blame it on hormones but let's just be honest you guys <laughs> I'm a um, super emotional Uh, type of person. Um, I just, I feel things really hard and I feel things, I feel things very deeply. That's just who I am. I will never make apologies for that. Um, It's just who I am. And uh, I'm really feeling it right now because I'm sitting here in my home office and my daughter is sleeping and This is the last Sunday night, the last weekend that our little girl will be three. And it's very, very bittersweet. You know, it's just bittersweet. What else can I say? It's like you, you want to see your children thriving and she's, she's thriving and you want to see your kids happy and healthy and growing and, you know, hitting their milestones and, and doing all the things that kids are supposed to do. And part of, you know, being a parent is helping them to do that and helping them to grow up. But then it's like, oh my gosh, like she's going to be four, like four years, four years ago, I was pregnant with her and I was right there at the home stretch. Um, and <laughs> everyone laughs because both both my daughter and my son are uh, have very similar, well, I'll get into the dates in a second, but let me just say this. My daughter's C-section, which was an elective C-section, I have an episode on that if you want to go back and check that out, um, where I talk about, you know, taking ownership of your choices and your body and not everybody, you know, you have to do what you have to do for you. And that was something that I wanted to do. Everybody looks at me like, oh my God, you had a C-section. Yes, I chose to have one. <laughs> um, and you have that option. She was due to be delivered November 3rd, 2016. My son, so I'm having a little boy, uh, was scheduled to be delivered November 4th, 2020. (laughs) So it's just, this was not planned. We did not 
purposely do this. Um, although I'll say, you know, I like to kind of keep my pregnancies in the deductible year for insurance, okay? <laughs> but um, we have now, we'll have two little pumpkin Halloween October babies. And October is a very special time in my family because number one, uh, it's my husband's birthday. So we actually just celebrated my husband's 40th birthday. Definitely not how either one of us had planned that it would go, uh, being that I'm nine months pregnant and we're in the middle of a pandemic and I have to be extra special. I have to be extra cautious, um, with my pregnancy and, and, you know, that kind of thing. And then my husband and I got married in October. We got married October the 30th, 2010. So this is going to be our 10 year wedding anniversary because we love Halloween. And so we were married on Halloween Eve. We had a masquerade ball wedding. It was the most beautiful night ever. And just so happens, and again, it was not planned that way. Um, both of our children were planned, but we didn't intentionally say, okay, they have to be October babies. <laughs> um, and we had our daughter in October of 2016. And our son originally was due on 11-11, and he's coming in October. So that's one of the things I want to talk about today because there's not much time left in October, which means there's not much time left in this pregnancy either. <laughs> and I am feeling it. Feeling all the things physically, uh, I have all the emotions that are going through me, and um, there's just a lot on my mind. And so while there's a lot of topics I'd love to cover, this was just heavy on my heart and heavy on my mind, and I wanted to get this episode out because I just did a YouTube video. So I've been doing a plus-size pregnancy YouTube series on my channel, which I will link in the show notes. And if you're not subscribed to my channel, please make sure that you do that. Um, in addition to that series, I also publish all of the podcast episodes on my channel. Some of those are just audio uh, videos, but some of those I actually do record with the camera. There's also other videos on there. So that link is in the show notes, or you can put Irresistible University, that's Y-O-U, it's a play on words into the search bar and you can find it. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. So I just did a video around updates on my third trimester and some of my symptoms and some of the things I've been going through. And I felt like the video um, was a little bit rushed and I wanted to get into more detail. So I decided, hey, let's just do that today on the podcast. This is a little bit out of the norm of my typical um, topics. Um, I'm saying I'm um a lot because I'm nervous and because I'm just, I'm really a little out of sorts if you can't hear it in my voice for those of you that are used to listening to me because I'm getting really nervous. <laughs> um, I'm just feeling a lot of feelings right now. And one of those is, you know, my daughter's birthday, which again, I'm so excited. I'm so happy. She's the biggest blessing in the world. She's the funniest, sweetest, just, she's a firecracker. She's this little ball of energy and I can't, I just can't even imagine my life without her. And it's hard to even remember life before her. And I'm feeling all kinds of things also because, you know, with my son on the way, literally, um, any day now, which I'll get into in a second. I'm excited. I'm happy. He is so wanted, just like she was so wanted. And I know he's going to complete our family. And we're so anxious and excited to meet him. But there's also, and this is where, you know, it's it's hard to explain this, I guess, unless you maybe you've been through it. I don't know if you can relate to this, but there's also this like, oh my God, how is our family going to change, right? It's like we talked about all of this before we even made the decision to have a second. Um, both of our kids, you know, came with a lot of discussions <laughs> and um, thinking about it before we just, you know, did it. And... Now that we're down to the wire, it's like I'm I'm sitting here like, oh my gosh, how are things going to change? 
Am I going to have as much time with Catalina and Chewy? Chewy's our Chihuahua, who's also like a baby to us. Um, he's 11 years old, and we've had Chewy since he was six weeks old. So he was literally our first child. I always say first, F-U-R, like play on words again. And just thinking about how the dynamic will change, and I think, you know, whatever I want to do, I just leave the house, and, and Cat... I throw her in the car and I'll throw Chewy in the car and we'll go to the park and we'll go do fun stuff. And, you know, we, we go and we just kind of do whatever we want to do when we want to do it. And, and we don't really work around nap times anymore. And we don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. And I had to like check myself because I remember these same feelings of, anticipation, excitement, happiness, nervousness, but also anxiety on how our life would change before she was born. Where, you know, Chewy has been there with me. Literally, I spend more time with Chewy than I do any other human being in my life. More than my husband, more than my daughter. <laughs> he works with me all day long. Um, I would just throw him in the car back then and him and I would go do stuff together. He went on vacations. He goes on vacations with us. You know, we would travel with him and he's just a big part of our family. Chewy is not, if like if you were to say just a dog to me, like I'm going to argue and I'm going to, we're going to fight because he's not just a dog to me. Um, and I was so terrified that he was going to, like, <laughs> I know we, like, humanize our, our dogs, right? I was so terrified that Chewy would be bad at me or he would feel left out or he would be sad or he would just, you know. And I swear to you, I even would feel guilty when she came and I would have to leave the house to take her to, like, appointments and such when I didn't take him with us. I, I know. It's crazy. I'm that person. And that's why I had to check myself because I was like, Amy, you've been through this before. These are the same types of feelings. And then once Kat came home and we kind of got over the first, um, <laughs> the hurdle of those first few weeks and months where you're not sleeping and it's kind of like just surviving. And our family kind of started settling down and getting in our groove. It was just, it all fit right? Everything just fit together. And one of my goals is I wanted my daughter to have respect for animals, to love animals, to not just see animals as, as things. And she's a complete animal lover. She adores Chewy. That's like her little buddy. You know, I don't know that he feels the same way sometimes. <laughs> he just kind of tolerates her because she's very high energy but she adores him and seeing them together, like cuddled up on the couch. It's just, it warms my heart and I love it. And I can't imagine it any different now. So the logical side of my brain knows that everything will be okay. Everything will fall in its place. Um, is it going to be a little crazy at first? Absolutely. It's going to be different. You know, this is a big life change. Even though it's a positive change, it's still a life change, right? You know, there's positive stress and there's a negative stress. And, you know, when you're planning a wedding, it's happy, it's exciting, but it's stressful. When you're bringing a new baby into the family, it's happy, it's joyful, but it's stressful. And so, you know, I have that as a takeaway for you as well, that it's like not all stress means it's doom and gloom either, and so, yes, things are going to change. Schedules will be shifted around. <laughs> um, you know, we've got one child who's turning four in a couple days who, you know, has this independence, but she's still a baby at the same time, right? Like she can go get her clothes and put them on and, hey, go upstairs and get your shoes, you know? And we're going back to the the drawing board with having to do everything. And every um, every phase of childhood has its own challenges. Well, it's like, oh, thank God she can use the bathroom now on her own. Well, 
that kind of blows up in your face when you're driving down the road and it's like, oh my God, I have to pee. You're like, oh my God. So, <laughs> you know, where the baby's in the diaper, hey, you know, so there's, there's, there's challenges, there's pros and cons. And I know logically everything's going to be okay. Um, but it's one of those things right now where I kind of can't just settle down until he's here and everything's okay, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at and where my feelings are. And there's a lot going on in October, as I just said. And so throwing a pregnancy in the mix and trying to be as, as, best prepared as possible. It's it's like, oh my gosh, you have these nine months, which they kind of drag by. I feel like I've been pregnant for two years at this point, but then I also feel like I just found out. And then I also feel like I'm not prepared at all, but then I go in his room and I'm like, no, we're pretty good. Like there's still a lot of stuff we we're going to need, but we're good right now, right? Like we have the, the main things. And there's just a lot going on and I'm kind of in this place where I'm in the unknown at this point. So I had shared with you that my due date, so my due date was 11-11. They were going to take him for a repeat C-section on 11-4, the day after election day. <laughs> so every time I would see that on TV, like the election is in such and such days, I'm like, oh my gosh, like add one more day and that's us, right? So as of last week, um, our C-section has been bumped to October 28th, which is less than two weeks away at this point. So I was feeling pretty good about that. Um, I'm like, cool, we get another October baby. We love October. Let's just have like one massive party every year to celebrate all of our, like we have so many milestones in this month. So it's great. And then I got news on Thursday, there's a possibility that it could happen this week. So I'm uneasy because I don't know what's happening right now. And tomorrow, so tomorrow I go to, I have an appointment every single Monday and every single Thursday at this point. I have two appointments a week, sometimes three, and I'll get into that. They, um, I could go in tomorrow and possibly have a baby. That, that's a possibility. So um, make sure you're following me on Instagram. I'm at Irresistible Icing. I share all my behind the scenes stuff with the podcast. I also share like my pregnancy updates and just kind of our family, personal life. You get some, some behind the scenes on that too. So I could possibly have a baby tomorrow. And I'll tell you why in a second. So Thursday was my second trip to the hospital in two weeks. <laughs> I have spent the last two Thursdays at the hospital. This pregnancy has been, um, it's been different in lots of ways, but similar, like it was very textbook, very, um, you know, like the other up until about uh, two months ago. So when I basically hit the third trimester, things started changing a little bit for me. And they're definitely different than my pregnancy with my daughter. And so I shared this in my YouTube video, but I didn't get into a ton of detail. So I figured I could do that on this, on this episode. So around 28 weeks, um, they give you a glucose test because they have to see if you test for gestational diabetes. So for those of you that do not know, gestational diabetes is brought on by pregnancy and it is caused by the hormones in your placenta that are producing too much glucose into your bloodstream. So I had a feeling when I went to take the test that I wasn't going to pass. It was a gut instinct, a gut feeling. I had not been feeling well for a couple of weeks, just really sluggish fatigued, tired. And that was in the second trimester. And the second trimester, you're supposed to get like this burst of energy again. And I wasn't getting energy. I was depressed. I was fatigued. I had also just moved. We moved to a new house in the middle of the summer. So I figured a lot of my fatigue and such was from the move and just trying to do too much. And I'm sure that was a part of it for sure. So I failed the test. <laughs> as soon as I got that phone call and I saw it on the, the caller ID, I was like, well, they don't call if you pass. So I definitely failed. And I failed it so hard that they didn't even invite me to do the second test. So normally, 
if you pa if you don't pass the one hour glucose, they have you come back and do a three hour and then look at your numbers. And they said, at this point, we're going to just diagnose you because you were way over what that should have even been. So epic, epic fail. When I first got that phone call, um, I felt devastated. Maybe that's a little dramatic, but it's how I felt. I felt devastated. I felt like a failure. I felt like I failed, that my body failed my baby. I felt like I was a failure. And of course, you know, even all the work I do and that I have done with the emotional weight, of course, my brain immediately went to, well, this is because I'm fat. This is because I'm overweight. This is because of what I ate. I, I, I could have prevented this and kind of started going into like this pity party of blaming myself and feeling like I just, just feeling really let down. And at the same time, while I was feeling this, because they couldn't even get me in the office for like two weeks, right? They're like, oh, this is, you know, this is not a good thing, but we can't even see you for like two weeks. So, you know, you need to start checking your blood sugars, but we can't give you your stuff yet. And you need to start eating like a diabetic, but we'll see you in two weeks. So I took matters in my own hands. That's kind of how I handle, um, I'll have my pity party. And then it's like, all right, what the hell do I need to do to get out of this? And so while I'm like having a pity party, I'm going through my, my, <laughs> my refrigerator and my pantry and I'm like throwing out any junk, anything sugary, any, we had just bought like a cheesecake from Trader Joe's. I think I had one slice of it before I found out the news, just started throwing stuff in the trash, like taking matters in my own hands, taking charge. Okay. I know how to eat clean. I've never had to eat like a diabetic, which is, you know, even more extreme, but I can figure this out and I can control this in the meantime. And that's what I started doing. And I just, I'm the type of person that my way of handling a situation is to say, okay, what piece of this do I get to control now? And I like to educate myself. I just immerse myself in videos and podcasts and books and websites and just start like digesting as much information as possible. And so I got a good grip on some changes I could make in my diet because I was eating I was eating a lot more carbs this time around, a lot more sugar than I did last time. I did not I've never had gestational diabetes before. Um but the doctors and and a lot of the videos tell you this too and you know, I never brought this up to my doctor about me feeling guilty of anything. Like but they kept reassuring me you did not eat your way. In, you cannot eat your way into gestational diabetes. That's not how this works. This is not like type 2 diabetes in the sense that, you know, this is coming from your hormones. Like there are people who are, you know, marathon runners and vegans and they eat like perfectly and they're, you know, fit and muscular and, you know, all the things and they still get gestational diabetes. So, are there risk factors if you're overweight? Yes. Um, are there risk factors in my age? Yes. I am 39, so I'm not a spring chicken having my babies, okay? Um, but it is completely based on the hormones in your body, specifically in the placenta, which is why as soon as you deliver your baby and that placenta comes out of your body, in most cases, the gestational diabetes also goes away. So I do feel better knowing that. Um, but, you know, it, sometimes you're going to have a pity party and it's okay. And it's what I tell my clients all the time when they're going through things. I'm like, you're entitled to feel bad for yourself. You're entitled to have a pity party, but your pity party better have a start and an end time. Right? You better put a start and an end time on that baby. Because where it gets problematic is where you sit in the guilt and the shame and you dwell on and on and on and on and you don't take any action as a result, right? That's what we have to get away from. So I felt bad for about a day <laughs> and then I was good. Um, and like I said, as I was feeling bad, I was also like completely changing all my diet and the way I was eating and getting my walks in and um, movement and things like that are really good because... 
I wasn't as active this pregnancy as I was the first one. And that's just because I was extra tired, extra fatigued. And a lot of it was like depression and going through this during a pandemic. And I did a video on my YouTube on that as well, on the difference of being pregnant in a pandemic and just how it's exhausting and it's isolating and it's lonely. And it just, it really, um, I've had to work extra hard at my depression and anxiety this time around. And I'm feeling a lot better on that front. And I will say this, and it's very strange to say this, getting a diagnosis of gestational diabetes in a way, this sounds so strange, and I understand it sounds strange. It was kind of like a blessing in disguise because it snapped my ass back to reality of like, you you were eating clean before this. <laughs> like, you know how to eat. You know how to move. You need to be doing those things, you know. So it kind of like snapped me back to like my old habits. Um, some of my other healthier habits, it got me out of the bed where I was like, sleeping way too much like I would put my daughter down at night she goes to bed around seven thirty, eight o'clock and I couldn't move I couldn't get out of the bed and I would lay there for like two hours on my phone and sometimes I would fall asleep where normally when she goes to bed I'm like boom it's me time like I got stuff to do I got stuff to do around the house I got work to catch up on you know that kind of stuff and I wasn't doing that as much because I was just exhausted and I also noticed that around the time all this happened, it was around 28 weeks pregnant, um, I stopped gaining weight also, which, you know, I talk, I've talked about my weight gain a lot in my videos and my podcast and, you know, my last pregnancy, I gained 70 pounds, <laughs> 70 pounds, guys, that's a lot. It's like way more than you're supposed to. And right now, I think I'm around like, I, I'm well I'll get into this too um, I'm teeter-tottering between 50 to 55 so I think when it's all is said and done I'm going to be around 60 maybe um, which is interesting because I look bigger I feel bigger I'm gained less weight this time but I also started the pregnancy a little bit like 10 pounds heavier than it's just weird and ever since I got this diagnosis I actually had lost weight I had lost weight. I went down like five or six pounds because I was eating so much better and walking more and, and doing things. And now, though, um, that we're at the end, and I told you I go to the doctor like sometimes two to three times a week, there are times where I will go in on Monday, and on Thursday, I've gone up five pounds. And I go back again on Monday, and I'm down four to five pounds. So right now I just don't take my weight. Um, I don't want to say seriously, but I don't put a, I don't put a lot of weight <laughs> pun intended, I guess. I don't put a lot of weight on that because I'm at this point where things are fluctuating a lot. And I'll tell you why in just a second. Um, but I'm at the end and honestly, like the weight gain hasn't been a big issue for me because I've done the work, number one. And number two, I also know that this is my last baby. I have all the time in the world when he comes to work on my weight loss again, to get my body strong again, to start working out again, to get back where I want to be. And I'm not going to let that make my pregnancy an unhappy time right? It's, it's not going to, my weight is not going to dictate how I feel because I'm pregnant. Like you're supposed to gain weight. And I've accepted the fact that I just have a body that like, I telling you, like the minute I find out I'm pregnant, I put on like 10 pounds. My, it's just, it's just how I am and it's okay. Um, so anyway, that's kind of what I've been dealing with for the past almost what, eight weeks now with the gestational diabetes so it's like, hey, you're pregnant in a pandemic. You can't be around a lot of people. You shouldn't be in the stores that much. Your husband can't come to any appointments with you. Literally, zero appointments. Um, you can't have a baby shower. You cannot have any alcohol because you're pregnant. No margaritas for you. And now 
girl, no cheesecake for you either. <laughs> so like, oh my gosh, this is insane. This is insane. So, you know, I'm lucky in the sense that I know other ways to feel good that I don't have to rely on food and alcohol <laughs> that are not my sense, my, my prime source of entertainment, if you will. But, you know, I think the pandemic just has added this unbelievable layer to all of this. And mostly just, you know, my husband never missed one appointment with our daughter. And I even remember one time he almost didn't make it. And I came down the elevators. I had just finished at the doctor. And he was, I mean, running. (laughs) So cute. He was running through the lobby in his work clothes, dripping sweat, trying to get upstairs. And I had finished early. Um, So he never missed an appointment except for that one. I'm going to let that slide. Um, and we had this routine where we would go out to lunch afterwards and we would go shopping together. And I really missed that because that was really fun. And so it's been really hard um, to not share that experience together. Uh, and, and we're sharing the experience, but if you don't understand what I mean, it, it's just different where he's not there with me talking to the doctor and looking at the ultrasounds. And, you know, I always envisioned our our little girl would be in the room with us and get to see her brother on the screen and, and be a part of that experience too. And it's been really hard. Um, There's been days where I pull out of the driveway, you know, because a lot of my pregnancy was in the summer too. Right. And they would be in the garage getting ready to go in the pool while I was going to go to the doctor. And I would just tear up because it feels so isolating. It feels so lonely. Um, Even though, I mean, Frank couldn't be a better dad. He's like the best husband, the best dad. I know everyone says that, but God, he really is. Um, And not having that shared experience has been hard on both of us. Um, so, you know, I think it's just, this has not been a normal pregnancy in that sense where we're in a global pandemic and I'm not going to put myself in harm's way, you know, to have a few hours of socializing or to have a few, like, I'm just not willing to do that. (laughs) Right. Um, so that's been different. That's been different. I've talked a lot about that. Like I said, in some of my videos, I did a whole video dedicated to that. And I think there's, it's even in a podcast episode because I convert those to podcasts as well. So, you know, this pregnancy, gestational diabetes, like to the side, there's been extra anxiety around, oh my God, I'm bringing a baby into this world. that's like in turmoil right now. Like besides the pandemic, look at everything else going on. Um, anxiety from that, and that leads to me feeling depressed and just overwhelmed, just feeling overwhelmed with, with all of that. And I always in, and here's the thing, guys, um, one of my coaches, business coaches, she always talks about living in the and, and I love that because if I sit here and I'm having an emotional moment and I'm talking about anxiety and depression, overwhelm, that doesn't mean that I sit in that 24 hours a day. I can feel anxious and also excited at the same time. I can feel sad about the state of the world, but also grateful and blessed beyond measure to have another child. You know, everybody talks shit about 2020 and how they just want it over and it's the worst year of their life. And I have to be real with you. 2020 has been really good to our family. You know, we moved into a new house that we absolutely love. We are having a second baby. (laughs) Like there's been a lot of blessings for us where, you know, you can't blame things on a year. I just think that's kind of stupid. And that might say that because the year could have all these crazy things that are out of our control but you can also be happy at the same time for other things going on, right? We don't have to stay in that state of despair all the time. So I 
am very open about my story. I'm very open about my journey and what I go through because I know that there's someone out there that can hear this and feel validated feel like someone gets them they can feel heard you can hear yourself in my journey and my story and sometimes just having someone out there that you can relate to speaks volumes I think about when I was younger and the things I went through with bullying and body image and my weight struggles and I think if I would have had someone to relate to to validate me that would have been life-changing because that didn't exist back then. It just didn't exist. We didn't have these outlets that we have now through social media and the internet. And so that's why I'm willing to always put myself out there and and talk about these things. And it's just been hard. I'm not going to lie. Has it also been happy? Yes. It's been it's been so happy. Like it's so rewarding to see my little daughter like hug my belly and kiss her brother and talk to him and just, you know, again, it's like that living in the and you can feel happy, but also scared at the same time. Just like I told you at the beginning of the episode, it's like, it's, it's living in the bittersweet, right? You're living in the bittersweet where my daughter feels like she's growing so fast and time is slipping through my fingers, but at the same time, I am so grateful that she is thriving and growing and is the happy, healthy girl that she is, right? So it's bittersweet. It's living in the bittersweet. So that said, um, you know, I, (laughs) I shared a little while ago in the episode that the last two Thursdays in a row, two Thursdays in a row, I have spent at the hospital. Why Thursday? Well, I told you Thursdays I go for my appointment. So, oh yeah. So the gestational diabetes, let me just, let me touch on this for a second again. So I have been able to control my blood sugars with diet. So I follow a very high protein, you know, low, you still have to eat quite a bit of carbs, but you're eating, you know, you're not eating sugary carbs and things like that. So, you know, it's basically high protein, lowish carbs, and I have to do uh, glucose testing on my fingers four times a day. So four times a day, I have to prick my finger, put the little blood on a strip, and check my glucose numbers. And I've been able to control all of my numbers after my meals because you have to take your blood sugar an hour after you eat. So that's another thing that's, you know, as I got used to this, the way I have to eat, (laughs) taking all the glucose testing, that was also adding to my overwhelm in the very beginning of this diagnosis because it's like one more thing I have to worry about, you know, and I'm trying to like manage it and learn how to do it. And it's it's just a lot. It's been a lot. And so I've been able to manage my numbers after my meals so that they're within range. Okay. Now my fasting number, which is the number. So when you wake up in the morning and take your glucose, your blood sugar, um, that number was not where it needs to be. It was running like between five to 15 points over what it should be. And that is very, very common because when you're sleeping, your body starts producing these extra hormones, um, because you're not eating while you're sleeping and while you're pregnant, you're getting extra hormones getting produced because the baby's not being fed during that time. So I tried com- like all different combinations of things to eat before bed, eating less carbs, eating more carbs, trying different meals, trying different snacks, and it was basically just staying the same. So my doctor recommended, and I, I was like, I really was trying to avoid this. They put me on insulin <laughs> in the evenings only. So now I'm taking my blood sugar four times a day on my finger. And now I'm also injecting myself every night before bed with insulin. So that's five needles a day, guys. (laughs) Um, It's a lot. It's, It's not, now that I'm doing it, it's really not as bad as it sounds. It sounds scarier than it is. But 
you know, it's just something I have to do. And I know that this is temporary and it's for the best. It's for my baby. It's, it's for us to be healthy together. And this is what we have to do. So that said, oh, and because you have gestational diabetes, you have to be seen by a specialist in addition to your regular doctor, which is why I sometimes have to go three times a week. And because I'm on insulin now, I have to go in twice a week to have non-stress tests. You guys should just see a screenshot of my calendar at the moment. <laughs> like my calendar is, um, it, it's just insanity. It's absolute insanity at the moment. <laughs> like in addition to work, you know, running a business and trying to get things at a really good point um, for me to have a baby and then all these appointments, there's just a lot going on. So anyway, I have to go in twice a week for those stress tests. They put like these monitors on your belly to check the heart rate, to check movement. I also get ultrasounds every week now as well because they have to make sure that we're checking the, the fluid around the baby because one of the complications that can happen is that your amniotic fluid is lower. But right now, everything, knock on wood, thank you God, is okay. The baby's good. He is measuring a little bit ahead. Um, size wise. <laughs> uh, but other than that, he is healthy. He's thriving. He's doing good. But there's a high possibility he's got to come out this week. And we're going to we're going to find that out tomorrow. So tomorrow I may have a baby. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to see what happens. Um, but it might happen this week, which is crazy to me because it's going to be my daughter's birthday. I don't want her birthday to be overshadowed. Um, but, you know, when things are out of your control, they're out of your control. So two Thursdays ago, I was in the hospital because I went in for my checkup for my stress test. And the doctor that saw me that day was like, I'm going to go ahead and send you to the hospital. And here's why. I came into my appointment. My blood pressures are always really good, like in the 120s, 120 over 80. They're usually perfect. My blood pressure was running high. My feet and my hands were unbelievably swollen, unbelievably swollen. I had gone up five or six pounds in like two days from all the swelling. Um, I had lots of headaches, blurry vision, <clears throat> and all of those are signs of possible preeclampsia setting in. Now, my daughter came early for the same reason. I had gone in, my pressures were going up, the swelling was beginning, and my doctor was like, you're having a baby today. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. So I'm starting to experience that again. So I've been monitoring now also my blood pressures at home and I'm feeling better. Um, definitely. I've actually been feeling better the last couple days, actually, like a lot better as far as the headaches and the swelling and everything like that. But it does come and go. Um, it, it comes and goes. If I stand up too long, I'm swollen. If I sit down too long, I'm swollen. I can't get comfortable when I sleep. It's just a hot mess right now. So they sent me to the hospital to get further lab work and to um, keep me on monitors for my blood pressure to see if everything. And they're like, I don't think you're going to deliver tonight, but there is a possibility. But anyway, I got sent home. Everything was okay. My pressures went down. Um, my lab work was perfect. Everything was good. So then I went in this Thursday that passed and they were having issues mostly with the machines on the stress test. So they weren't getting the right readings, which means they can't technically send me home because they weren't getting the readings that they needed. It's so like, we're going to go ahead and send you over to the hospital, which thankfully was right next door. And it was just, I would think I was only there like 30 minutes. It was very quick because they have better machines and whatnot. So anyway, when I went to my appointment on Thursday though, the doctor that I saw, because um, I didn't see my normal OB, she said, I really think you need to have this baby next week because you're on insulin now and, you know, your your pressures have been going up and I just, you know, I think it's just best. Like, he's now considered full term as of this coming week, um, so there's really no risk as far as that's concerned because that was the concern prior to this. So anyway, she was supposed to talk to my doctor. I'll see what's going on this week. 
and I'm just kind of living in limbo. <laughs> I'm living in limbo right now. We're like, I have a new scheduled C-section, but I also have it in the back of my mind that at any given point that you go in this week, they could tell you, okay, let's just go ahead and do this. So my hospital bag has been packed for over a month anyway. And I'm just really making sure everything is there that I need. Um, you know, we're just, <laughs> I keep telling my husband, I was like, you better pack your bag. You better have everything ready to go. So that's just kind of where we're at right now is just, um, it's very anxiety inducing because I like to have a plan. <laughs> I like to know what's happening. And right now that's out of my control and that's what I have to accept. And I am accepting it because if I sit here and I dwell and I stress and I freak out, that's not helping me. It's not helping the baby. It's not helping the situation to change. It's not doing anything productive. And I, I will have these moments, like I'll wake up in the middle of the night, panicked, like, I'm not ready for this. I'm not prepared. Oh. And I don't care how much you prepare. You're never prepared, if that makes sense. Like, you're just not prepared because every baby's different. And, you know, there's really no amount of preparation for that moment right before that baby comes out. There just isn't. And so I think for me, it's just living in the unknowns right now, having that anxiety and also having that kind of sadness or like the grieving of our family dynamic changing, even though I know things are going to be so much better and they're going to be so worth it once he's here. Um, our lives are changing and they're changing for the better, but that's still again, there's positive stress too, right? There's still that positive stress. And, you know, I don't know what this is going to be like. And you sit there and you're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this with a, um, a preschooler and a baby and a business and this and that. And it's like, here's what I know. Okay. And this is how I find comfort. I had the same feelings before Catalina was born. Before she was born, I was working full time from home because I have worked from home now for 10 years. I was working full time from home as a director of education for an influencer network and running my business on the side. I didn't have the podcast yet. I wasn't running the program the way I am today. Um, it was very different, but I had my side business. I had my side hustle plus my full time job, which being the director of education, I had a lot on my plate, right? I had a set schedule. I had a pretty intensive job at the time, um, even though I was at home and I had that flexibility. And I just remember thinking, oh my God, how am I going to do this? How am I going to be a working mom? One of my goals in life is I never wanted to put my kids in daycare. Never. I don't knock anyone. I think you have to do what you have to do. But for me personally, one of my goals was I don't ever want to put my kids in daycare. That's just something I don't want to have to do. I want to be there. I want to be there for the milestones. I want to be present. I want to be around. But holy shit, how am I going to do this? Working a full-time director level job, plus having a side business, plus having a baby, I'm going to fall apart. And I don't know sometimes. I think the more you try to tightly hold on to something and control it, the less control you have because you just don't know until you're in it. And I don't know how, but somehow, and my husband and I, you know, he works as well. We're a great team. And somehow we have just pivoted and made it work. You know, he has changed schedules several times throughout all of that. My daughter was born in 2016. Um, by spring of 2018, I actually got laid off because our the company I worked for dissolved due to corporate mergers and such. And then I was on my own full-time running my side hustle is now a full-time business. So I've had a lot of changes. We've had a lot of pivots. And with each milestone and development change, you know, that comes with a baby where, you know, 
hey, the baby's only awake this many hours. Well, now the baby's not taking its nap. And now, you know, it's like, I don't know, but we just made it work. And we've never had to put our girl in daycare. We have always been able to do it. Has it been easy? Absolutely not. Has it been worth it? Hell yes. Hell to the yes, it has been worth it. And that's something I'm proud of. And one of my other things for me too was I always told myself, if I ever decide to have kids, because for a long time I didn't even know if I was going to have kids. I didn't want kids. But I always said, when I do, I don't want to ask anybody for permission to take my kid to the doctor. I don't want anyone having control over me in that way. If my kids are sick and I need to stay home with them, I don't need to feel bad about it. I want to have the flexibility to stay home with my kids. I want to have the flexibility to take my kids to the museum in the middle of the day and still be a career woman, still have a working business. That was something to me that I am so, it's like a core value for me, right? Like it's so important to me to have that autonomy and to be able to decide that today my daughter just needs me and I need to be mom and I have to turn everything else off for the day. That doesn't mean at eight o'clock at night when she's asleep, I'm not sitting in the home office working, recording things. You know, this is 10, 10, 10 30 at night. I'm recording my podcast because she's gone to bed for the night. So for me, it's just always been important to be able to be a mom and a businesswoman. I'm not going to sit here and choose one or the other. If you want to choose one or the other, I'm all for that. I'm all for you having that choice. For me personally, I love what I do. I love having my own I love having my own business. I love, you know, being a boss. I love also being a mom. And I find, I find, um, they're both different outlets for me. They're both different outlets for me. And I know I'm like, this podcast is like just a a chit chat and it's all over the place. I hope you don't mind that. But I think this really goes back to what does it mean to be irresistible you? What does that mean to you? Because becoming irresistible you is not about looking a certain way. It's not about weighing a certain number. It is about creating the life that you crave to have. It is about designing your life, not just accepting what's thrown at you. It's about designing and creating the life that you want, the life that you crave, and the life you deserve. And I have always known that for me, I need to have the ability to do what I want to do when I want to do it. That's just me. It's my personality. I'm a type 8 on the Enneagram. I'm a Leo. I don't mess around. And I have never done well with needing permission. Well, I'll come back 10 minutes early and I'll leave 10 minutes late so I can go. Like, and honestly, right now, I don't even know how I would do it with all these appointments. Like, there's just so much on my plate right now. And I kind of went on this tangent because what I was sharing was that I had all these feelings before Catalina came. How am I going to do it? How am I going to balance being a work at home mom with being a mom? And I'm going to have to give something up and I'm going to have to do this and I'm going to have to do that. And the truth of it is I didn't have to give anything up. I have a lot on my plate, but I think I thrive that way. And what's interesting, because I would think, how am I going to work full time and have a side hustle? And now it's like the problems you have now are the things you prayed for right? Now I think I don't work full time for anybody. I work for myself and I'm sitting here going, oh my God, how am I going to make this work? How am I going to keep my business running with a baby and a preschooler and a dog and a house? And da, 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 da. how am I going to make this work? And I have faith that I can't worry about it because somehow it always works itself out. 
it just does. And it's beautiful. And so, you know, I sit here and go, oh my God, but last time I had 12 weeks of paid maternity leave. What am I going to (laughs) do? Right. (laughs) And what was so interesting is when I had my maternity leave with the old, with my old company that I worked for, you know, it's still not your full pay. And I was tripping about that. How am I going to make that work? And listen, sometimes the more we stress, the more we try to just grip it so hard and, 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 and worry it, worry about it, the more stressful it becomes. And so I just kind of surrender and I let things go. It doesn't mean I don't have a plan. You can't just do that. I have a plan. I have things in place. We've set up systems and automations and we have things that are going to be happening for my clients and everything is, is where it needs to be. Right. Um, and sometimes you just kind of have to surrender to the process and know that you have what it takes to make things work and you'll make the right decisions in the moment when you need to make them. So it's like this balance of like plan what you can plan, prepare for what you can prepare and the rest of it, you've got to surrender to it and know that you'll be able to get through it because you will, because you will. And the thing with, with motherhood and bringing a new baby into the house, everything is a phase nothing lasts. I mean, here I am like crying about my girl turning four, right? (laughs) And I remember a couple days of being home. She was home maybe a couple days and I just sat on the couch and I cried because it was almost bedtime. And Frank's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I don't want to go to bed. I hate bedtime. It's horrible. We're going to be up in two hours and then another two hours and another two hours and I'm never going to sleep again. And just all the dramatics were coming out. Um, you know, baby blues and hormones are just not, not cool. (laughs) Anyway, he's like, babe, he's like, this is temporary. This is temporary. It's not always going to feel like this. I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. You're right. So you just kind of have to lean into it and embrace it and know that everything is a phase. Every single thing is a phase and it will pass. And then you'll go, how do we get through that? I don't know. I don't know if I, it wasn't for pictures and videos. I don't remember the first couple months. I don't remember it. It's like a blur. It's a blur because you're sleep deprived and you're, you know, and so then in a lot of ways too, I, I feel much more at ease because I'm like, I've done this before. I'm not worried about every little thing, you know, oh my God, I got to wash all the clothes before that put on the baby and all that kind of crap. I'm like, you know what? It's fine. It's like the commercial where the lady drops the bottle or the the passy or something uh, with the first baby, and she's like disinfecting it and cleaning it and getting a new one. And the second baby, she just wipes it on her shirt and goes. This kind of is what it is, right? <laughs> um, so so there's that, and there's just the anxiety too of like, what will this look like with, you know, um, with my daughter? It was like, excuse me, we just. We were, we were on the go because I refused to stop living my life because I had a baby. I'm like, I'm not going to be sitting at home miserable just because I have a baby. Because I would hear these moms like, I don't get to go anywhere and I don't get to take showers. I'm sorry. You have time to take a shower. That is a choice. You know, are there days where it's absolutely hectic? Yes. But not taking care of yourself, that is not okay for me. That is just not okay. You have five minutes in your day to take a shower. Um, and so I was always on the go doing things. I mean, two, three days home from the hospital. And now I don't know what that looks like because this virus is scary. And having a baby with no immune system, it's scary. So there's that layer of anxiety that we can just top on everything else that's going on right now. Um, but yeah, guys, like I just... I wanted to do a little bit of a personal update, what's been going on in my life outside of, you know, Irresistible You and and all those kinds of things. And we did take our maternity pictures a few weeks, oh my God, a month ago. It's been a month. Yeah, it's been a month ago. And I'm glad we did it um, then because I just, 
don't feel so hot right now. And those pictures I will be putting, I actually have some of my Instagram already and I'm going to be putting some more of those up throughout the week. So again, make sure you're following me at Irresistible Icing and I'll share more of those pictures with you guys as well. They came out really great and I love them and I'm so glad to have them. And that's one thing I will say, and I've shared this before in other pregnancy videos and podcasts, but especially when you struggle with your weight and your body image and your confidence, pregnancy can be a mind F, okay? Because your body's changing, you're gaining weight, you're growing. Um, And what I don't want for anyone is to miss out on this experience because you're worried about what you look like. Because I promise you, your body is beautiful. It is doing an amazing, amazing thing. And that needs to be celebrated. And this is also temporary. You will have your body back. It will belong to you again. You can lose the weight. And I want you to embrace the belly and your body and just loving yourself for what you're going through and what you're able to accomplish through your pregnancy. And so take the pictures. Please take the pictures. Even though you don't feel like taking them, please do it. And I, anyone that's going through a pregnancy, please hire a professional and take maternity photos. You will not regret it. What you will regret is looking back and not having any of it documented. Both of my maternity photo shoots, I did not feel beautiful right beforehand. I felt huge. I felt gross. I felt um, just, what else can I say, <laughs> right? Like just just not feeling my best. And now I look at pictures from both pregnancies and I love them and they're beautiful. And that's just meeting yourself where you are, right? You're meeting yourself where you are and you're embracing this is where I am. This is the body that I have and look what my body is able to do. And you have these memories that you can share with your kids. And that's what I plan on doing. And my daughter to this day, she's always going and getting her maternity photos and looking at them. And she loves it. So anyway, that's all the stuff going on in my life at the moment. So um, again, keep up with me on Instagram. That's where you'll probably find out first if I'm in the hospital or not this week. We shall see what will happen. Um, And I'm going to just keep doing what I can do to take care of myself. And the podcast is not going anywhere. We have a lot of episodes that are pre-recorded that are going to be going up every single week. So that will not change. Um, I will still be you know, active on social media. I may not be as active for a week or so, understandably so. And for all of my clients that are inside of my program, I will be sharing with you this week exactly what our plans are and how things are going to look um, over the next couple of weeks, depending on when the baby comes. But I, if anything, you're getting even more from me over the next couple of weeks. So we'll be talking about that soon. So let's continue this conversation inside of the podcast discussion group. You can go over to Facebook, type in Irresistible You Podcast and join the group. The link is also in the show notes. Again, the best place to reach me on a daily basis is always Instagram. I love Instagram. I do a lot of stories. I'm always over there. Um, And it's more in the moment type stuff. So I hope this was helpful. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I know it was a little bit all over the place, just having a chit chat about um, where I'm at and where I'm at in my pregnancy and, and what's happening. So just send me good vibes. Send me all the good vibes my way. I appreciate it. I love you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Until the next one, stay irresistible. Bye, guys.